in his grace for us and in all that life throws at us. And I know that we all come from different places this week. We've all encountered different moments of life. However, one thing is for sure that God was with us and God is going to be with us in the week to come. And that is our assurance as God's people. And it's funny because as we are stepping into uh, the second week of our sermon series called How to Hug a Porcupine, I still haven't seen or been able to hug a porcupine. I don't know if any of you have been able to. Um, the closest thing that I have seen is that on the way to church, there was a skunk that was embraced by a car and uh, a little more than its capacity to handle. And um, uh, I would say that it was clear who lost in that conflict. And so um, very clear on that. Conflict in itself is very interesting because I would say without a shadow of a doubt, all of you who are in any relationship in your life, one way or another, are going to deal with conflict. It's just part of uh, being human, part of being in relationships, and, and that is what this sermon series is about. It's about relationships, and because it's very essential that we are about relationships that are godly. We are about our relationships here at church that help us to fulfill the local mission that God has given us here at Southport. And so I'm excited to continue to talk about that and invest in that and grow in that. Last week, we talked about trust. What happens when there's a, an absence of trust? And we wanted that to be the foundation of every relationship. And, you know, conflict is interesting because I live in a home with uh, four ladies, and um, there's conflict. <laughs> there's some drama mamas here every once in a while. And, uh, and this is before the teen years. And so my son and I, we uh, we've, are developing a little kind of code of what it's going to be like in the future. And so... You know, the Bible says that um, God will go before you, and so I would say and ask that if you want to pray ahead of time into the teen years of my household, I gladly and would appreciate your prayers for, for us. And so we will see. Conflict comes up in many different ways, it, in our choices, in our desires, and sometimes in advertising. And before we hit the screen, um, Burger King, our uh, one of our fast food chains, felt that and realize that there are a lot of you that live in conflict when it comes to their menu. That some of you are burger people, but some of you are also burrito people. And that there is a conflict when you pull up to Burger King because there's not both there. Well, let me assure you that starting tomorrow, you are going to be able to pick up your very own Whopperito. Oh my goodness. So I've never had a burrito with pickles in it, um, and I don't think I'm going to, but if this is uh, going to solve some inner conflict for you, then you can say thank you to Burger King. But conflict results in some pretty weird things sometimes, and um, in our relationships it can be nasty, in our relationships it can, it can be messy, but what is assured that in your relationships conflict is going to come? I remember the day when I came home and one of the two roommates I was living with had overturned the tables and the chairs and the rugs and everything in our common living area. It looked like some gangster came in and ransacked the place. And I, I love that word, ransack. We don't use cool words like that very often. But And it was clear that my roommate, who was a fireman, who most of the week when he wasn't at work was cleaning and organizing and and doing everything, usually without a shirt on, which bothered me because he's in better shape than me. But it was one of those things where he was that way, but us other two guys, we weren't that way. And at the time, we were all single guys, and, um, and it was clear that we were obviously coming into conflict. And when I came into my house, which was just turned over in disarray, I texted him, and I said, it looks like we need to talk. Dot, dot, dot. And he wrote back, ready when you are, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Which I texted in frustration, let's do this, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and so he came home, and, uh, <clears throat> and once he came in, he said, who's going to go first? A little puffed up, you know. And I said, oh, I will, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> And I stood up, and, and in that moment, there was just, I don't know if it ever happens to you, but there's kind of just this flash that, of information or truth or revelation that God gives you. 
where you have this choice to either go about what how you are going to go through life or you are going to consider what God wants for you to go through life. And in that moment, I realized and I understood that I care about my roommate. I care about his emotional well-being. I care about who he is and in his spirit. And I realized that there was just a real reality that what was inside of him that was silent and that was brewing and building on the inside had come out on the outside in a messy, just disorganized and terrible way. And I had to ask the question, did, did the conflict that we were about to have, was it more important than the relationship that we were being threatened to keep? And I realized that this was going to be a make it or break it conversation. And I got up and I said, you know, you, you, you deserve to live in a clean home. And he's like, wait, what? <laughs> And I could see like his fists were kind of doing this and his scrunched up brow kind of relaxed and and uh, and you know and, and even though I, he had made me feel threatened, even though he made me feel unsafe, even though it kind of challenged our trust in our relationship, I, I realized that it was important that I dealt with the conflict in a way that allowed us to have a dialogue, that allowed us to maintain the relationship that God had given us. That was more important than being right or putting him in his place or whatever. And the thing is that we all have dealt with conflict. I can imagine that today, here on the way to church, there probably was some conflict going on with some of us on the way to church, right? I mean, why wouldn't there be? I mean, if we were to understand that if any supernatural force that opposes the will of God was going to take the opportunity when we are inviting into our lives the opportunity to do what we've been created to do, worship God, what a great opportunity then to ruin and cause conflict on the way to church. I mean, my goodness, conflict is everywhere. And I would say that it's, it's so important that we understand that a lot of the times when we think of conflict, we've been conned. And that's the title of our sermon, the con of conflict. Say with a couple people around you, you've been conned. You've been conned. You can tell the same person three times. Hopefully you'll get it then. And I say you've been conned with conflict because some of us, a lot of us, even myself at times, have developed this fear of conflict. We run from it. We hide from it. We ignore it. We don't want to deal with it because there probably was this time in our lives when our opinions, our views, our understandings of our God-given voice somehow came into conflict with someone else that we know. And we had a choice. Either we were going to use the voice that God gave us, or we were going to be silent. We were going to stuff it, or we weren't going to deal with it. And maybe that one time we did use our voice, we weren't heard, we weren't understood, we weren't validated, or it just was a mess. And so we've reinforced that, rather than living into the purpose and the way of how to build a healthy relationship when it comes to conflict. And when we silently or passively remove ourselves from conflict, then we give birth to fear, and we bring our relationships into a state that God never wanted them to. Because of our broken and our sinful nature, we give reason and a cause to, to keep the fear of conflict alive. You know, conflict, we can't escape it, no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we ignore it, no matter how hard, hard we stuff it down. Unless you're a person who's stationed in Antarctica and there's nothing with you but ice and penguins, you are going to deal with conflict. And I've known someone in Antarctica, and that was the case. He didn't have a lot of conflict. He was very bored, though. <laughs> so the con of conflict versus healthy uh, conflict in relationships looks like this. If you bind with the con, then you're going to believe that we need to put up false realities. We need to portray false emotions or false statements. We say, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. I'm over it. It's okay. I don't think about it anymore. When really, we haven't dealt with it. And it festers and it builds and it starts to protrude in ways that are not healthy for us. But in healthy relationships, we get the chance to be authentic. We get the chance to use our voice. We get the chance to deal with things before they go too far or go too long or, or, or start to derail and, and start to afflict that trust that we built. The con of conflict it, it causes us to waste time 
in posturing or, or managing personal risk. I mean, I've been in places or I've been in roles where I knew it wasn't safe. And so in order to avoid conflict, I've maneuvered or I've said things or I've worn a certain smile on my face, even though on the inside, it wasn't okay. And what a waste of time. What a waste of energy. Because really, it really forfeited what God wanted to do in my life at that time and in other relationships. And I think it's such a waste of time if we have a fear of conflict. And that we're not willing to go into those authentic places. Because in healthy relationships, when conflict comes, we're able to deal with them so we can solve real problems quickly. Instead of wasting time on the fear of conflict. Everyone do this. Make a triangle with your hands. Mm -hmm. Some of you may be like, wow, my nails look terrible. But <laughs> in relationships, I don't like triangles. <coughs> if, if we got a dialogue, I want it to be a straight line between you and me. So no triangles in our relationships. Triangulation is terrible because what it does, it back channels, it launches personal attacks, it gossips, it, it undermines the trust that we've sought to build in our lives can't have triumphs in our lives because the thing is we have to minimize the drama mama and we have to work through the critical topics and if we if we attest that we love God God I love you and I'm going to do whatever you call me to do and I'm going to serve you and I'm going to be obedient to you but we are not obeying and following God and treating others with dealing with conflict then we fall short in obeying God <coughs> He's called us to have healthy conflict with one another. And that's hard. And we need the Word of God, and we need the Holy Spirit, and we need the church to help us in knowing how to deal with conflict. And that's why we are going to turn our verse today. And it's going to be coming out of the verse, uh, book of James. Because when we spike up like a porcupine, and we start to poke out because of conflict, then we really are not enabling God to teach us how to be relationship builders as the people of God. Because we seek to build relationships as disciples, not people who hold the label of Christians. Big difference. Book of James, chapter 3, verses 17 through 18 say this. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. In the conflict in your relationships, what is your intention? That they stop doing that? That they validate me, love me, it's about me? Or is it about, are we able to find that in conflict, can we have a pure intention to honor God by the way we treat one another in conflict. <coughs> we need to understand that when conflict comes and we're relying on the wisdom of God, then I say embrace conflict. Bring conflict. If conflict comes in your life, then I would say it gives you a chance to show how amazing God is. If conflict is coming in your life, then it gives you a chance to authenticate, yeah, I am a new person in Christ. Yeah, you may have dealt with me years ago, a month ago, yesterday, and I was just so mean and all these things. But because of Jesus now and the new life I have in him, bring the conflict. Because I'm going to authenticate that I'm a new creation. That's what conflict can do for the people of God. It provides you with an opportunity to show that you're a disciple of Christ, not just a label holder as Christians. And it's a proving ground for your faith, that your faith is not just about helping and coping with your pain. It shows how you can actually believe in this thing called discipleship, growing in the image and living more into who Jesus calls us to be, to be like him. And the question is, are we willing to demonstrate that in our lives and in our relationships? We're to love peace, or peaceable. Seek to not find some kind of normalcy in tension of undealt with conflict. We live in a culture today where, where people like to brag and they talk all the time about the conflict in their lives. But they never deal with it. And it's almost as if they want to 
be validated. They want to be heard. They want to feel important by the amount and the undealt conflict that they bring into the relationships. That's, that's our culture. Oh, my boss is this. Oh, my person is this. Or my coworker is this. Or my kids are these. And, and all this conflict is reason to deal or listen to your life. Sorry, but that shouldn't be the way we're talking about our relationships in our lives. It was interesting. I was with my family, and we went over to Arden Mall, and we're discovering, like, you know, West Sacramento and the Sacramento area. And, and um, so I needed to do some work, and there was a Starbucks there at Arden, and it's on the outside. And uh, so the kids went and walked around the mall with, with my wife, Jess, and um, so I sat and was doing some work. And you just see the world go by, you know, and so many types of people and different things going on, and you hear conversations. And uh, two young adults came by, and uh, they worked for the same uh, store uh, inside the mall. You know, I could tell by their, their little tag. And, and the young lady was, this was her last day of work that I found by hearing the earshot. And I wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but it was just so one of those conversations where you can't escape, right? And you're just like, I have my bubble here, but your bubble is just doing this, and then my bubble, you know, I can't do anything about it because there's no other plugs or chairs to do anything. And um, and it was her last day of work, and she was all about the conflict in her life, how terrible her boss is, how terrible the coworkers are, how she just hates when people come in and they try to get a lower price or a deal, and then two people in a car went by who's a routine customer of theirs, and she just complained, complained, complained. The conflict, the conflict, the conflict. Like, her life was nothing but conflict. And I heard that the young man, through various threads of conversation, is actually a Christian. It's actually someone who says they know God and believe in God. And so I was kind of waiting for him to respond in a way that's like this verse. But he said nothing. Now, I get it. We've all been in situations where we are in a relationship with people, and you're like, do I let them know that I have a faith? Do I let them know that I love God? Do I let them know that they are just sitting in the middle of all that worldliness? And what do I do about that? And it was challenging to me because it made me realize that if the good news is worth anything, then we have to act and we have to treat each other like it is good news. The good news really is for us to bring into the conversations that are full of hypocrisy and partiality and all these things. Otherwise, it's no good have to have the good news. We need to be considerate. Putting others first in a way to not hurt them, but be authentic with them. Are you full of mercy? Are you a merciful person? Are you, are you able to, or are you willing to yield and to forgive? Because that's what God's called us to be when we, when we engage in conflict. I could have been I had no mercy in my roommate. I'm bigger than him. I could have done something about that. But I didn't. I realized that God had called me a different way. And the reason and the, the result that we hope in our relationships from this verse is that we are peacemakers. Reconciling adversaries. And I would say that the first adversary that when we begin or in our life with Jesus is that we have to reconcile our own heart to God. That we are in conflict by our will and God's will. And it comes up and it bubbles up in different ways. Things you never knew were an issue or a challenge to, to yield to God and His wisdom. And we have to make peace with God. So that we can build that trust in our relationship with God so that we can live it out with others. And I think that there is a misconception about Christians when we hear the word, oh, they're, they're peacemakers, or we're to be peacemakers. And I think that misconception is, is that they need to be all lamb and no lion. That they need to be docile and doormats and passive and, and uh, just, you know, play the guitar and look cool or whatever it is. But that's not it. And on the other end, they're not to be all lion and no lamb, where... There are people in the Christian world that are abrasive and somehow they're kind of violent in their language and, and sometimes they leverage spiritual talk where it's more oppressive and abusive. There is spiritual abuse out there by the leaders of the church, unfortunately, and it's so sad because it creates unhealthy conflict and it stifles the church. God has called us 
to be peacemakers, meaning that we are to go into conflict in a way that is full of wisdom, that is pure and peaceable and gentle and willing to, to yield and be full of mercy and good fruit so that what results is righteousness and peace. Don't you want righteousness and peace in your relationships? Then we have to be in conflict. Isn't that funny? We can't run from it. That's part of the call that God has given us as his people. We are the hope of the world by the presence of God living in us, through us, and being experienced because our faith is bringing peace and resolving conflict in the world. On your street, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your family, in your marriage, in your kids, in your other relationships. Because the Spirit of God wants to resolve the adversary nature of our hearts between us and God and with each other. So, in what relationship of your life right now have you settled for the con of conflict? Where are you most fearful of conflict in your life right now? Whereas what is loud and hurting and full of unmet needs and unfulfilled resolution on the inside remains silent and slowly building up, or it's maybe about to burst from the seams, but you've coped with it with some other habit or some other substance or some other person or some other distraction, but you fail to see that God is calling you to be ushered into the, the very nature of saying, deal with the conflict. Put it on to me, onto my yoke, onto my burden, Jesus says, so that we're able to see, as James points out, that we need to walk with the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we get to do. And the thing is, is, it may hurt, it may be messy, you may not be good at it when you approach conflict with someone that you're in conflict with right now. But we need to bring peace by seeking to honor God and how we approach, how we move through, and how we resolve the conflict in our relationships. It needs to be part of who we are. Don't waste the time that you have with one another. Don't waste the opportunity that God has given you in these relationships. Because I, I honestly see that the way that we deal with conflict as a church directly, directly affects our mission here. If we are people who are not able to learn how to deal with conflict with all this verse says and all the fruits of the Spirit and by the power of the Holy Spirit, then it, the relationships that we have with one another can't be what God wants. They're what we want. They're what we stifle them. And I directly feel that we need to be a, a church, we need to be a people in Southport that is able to deal with conflict well. <laughs> so that we can expand the kingdom. So that we can save souls. The people that are perishing right now in our church need Jesus. People that are perishing in the community need Jesus. And the way that we do that is by being peacemakers. Is by willing to go into conflict and say, I may not have it all together, but I have the wisdom of the Lord. So let's do this. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so don't settle for the con of conflict. Because I want to encourage you. The Holy Spirit is with you. He is present. He is going to give you the words. He's going to supply the means. He's going to provide the opportunity. And he will see you through so that the result is God's plan for your relationships. God's plan for your marriage. God's plan for your kids. God's plan for your career. And all these things that lead into your life that sometimes we don't know how we're going to make peace with. But God has that way by the Holy Spirit. And I think what's really important is that you see that in this series of how to be a, how to hug a porcupine. Last week, we laid trust. This week, we talked about conflict. And next week, we're going to talk about commitment. Now, commitment are you failing or are you following through? And it all and I gave everyone one of these last week. And I hope you put it somewhere. And I hope if you don't know where it is, that's okay. Maybe you'll find it. But um, I got some pocket land on there. Why don't we do that? Um, don't be the porcupine. Do 
deal with the conflict. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you're able to embrace conflict and you're able to see it be transformed for God's good and God's glory. And I pray that this vernacular of the porcupine gives you a chance to have conversation with people. When people are bringing the drama to your footstep and you're able to say, you're kind of a porcupine. And be like, what are you talking about? Well, let me tell you about it. And we can go into it and have that chance to to share God's good and goodness and God's will and God's love for them. And I pray that we can continue to allow conflict by having the wisdom and the intentions of God to be peacemakers.